You know our gospel reading on this Easter Sunday from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and went, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming, bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, he saw only the linen cloth. Then he returned home, wondering what had happened. This is God's word for us today. For those who are a regular part of our congregation know that, that our church has been reading through the entire Bible straight through uh, during this calendar year, during 2022, and we actually made it all the way th- up until 2 Kings, through 2 Kings, uh, before we decided to take a break for Holy Week and Easter, and we'll pick back up next week. But one of the things I found really helpful in reading the Bible straight through, which I haven't done in, in a lot of years, it's been a long time since so I've just read it straight through, was being able to understand and experience the grand sweep of the story when you just sort of pick passages here and there, kind of scattered around. You don't get a sense of how it all fits together, how God is working through the entire story. And that's been a blessing for us. And, and beginning in the book of Genesis, we saw these, these themes emerging, and, and it's helpful because every single story fits in to the very things God's been doing from the beginning, that, that God has made us in the divine image and that we're part of a good and a beautiful creation, but that we are caught in a downward spiral of sin and of disobedience and of rebellion and of brokenness. And that's our very much lived experience but that God never gives up on us. God never gives up on creation. God is always and continually at work for our redemption and our restoration. And in story after story that we've been reading this year, we saw the ways that God was at work trying to redeem us and trying to restore us. We read about God calling Abraham and Sarah and the promises he made to them and his descendants. We saw God free his people from slavery in Egypt and make covenant with them at Mount Sinai and then lead them through the wilderness and into the promised land and call forth leader after leader after leader to help them deal with these threats within and without. And through all of this time, all of the stories we read, God has ever been faithful. Story after story of human disobedience and going our own way and following our own will and really, really messing things up. And yet, with each of those stories comes a story of God redeeming us. God redeeming us. God never giving up on restoring a right relationship with his people. Now, we have a lot more stories to go in the Old Testament, and again, we'll pick up with those again next week. But really, this whole story, everything that we're reading all year round, it is, it finds its culmination. It finds its culmination here on Easter Sunday. It finds its climax at this empty tomb. Luke's gospel and his account really from beginning to end is my favorite gospel. Now, I know there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're not supposed to play favorites. They're all Gospels, just like our kids. We're not supposed to play favorites, but we do, right? Yeah? No? You don't? We only have an only child, so it's fine for me. (laughs) Luke is my favorite. And in Luke's Gospel, we begin, just as we just sang in King of Kings, we begin with the arrival of an unlikely king who was born poor and humble. And just as the angel Gabriel announced to Mary the significance of the son that she was to bear, so at, at, at Jesus' birth, the angel sang, glory to the newborn king. 
And yet with all of these angels and all of the glory and all the ways at the beginning of the gospel that were pointed to who Jesus is, the only people who were there that night as Jesus was born to worship him were these poor, lowly shepherds coming in from the fields, there to greet the one who is our salvation. And the same Jesus begins his ministry, as we read in Luke, as a teacher and as a prophet. He goes throughout Israel and he calls people to a radical way of life, where enemies become friends, where the poor are cared for, where people find forgiveness for their failures. And people are drawn to this message. And at the same time, the rich and the powerful are called out and challenged on their priorities and on their true commitments, and those who are self-righteous find themselves called out for their hypocrisy. And then Jesus went from town to town, and he invites people to follow him and to live under God's reign where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for the sake of Jesus will find it. And he did these signs and wonders where he heals the sick and he feeds the multitudes and he casts out demons. And all of these Israelites, they begin to see something in Jesus, and a hope gets sparked in them that this Jesus will be the one who rescues Israel from the Romans. That, that this is the one who's going to lead us to set up a kingdom of peace and injustice, that this long hoped for kingdom, they've been oppressed for so long, they've been without hope for so long, and they begin to place their hopes in this Jesus. But the story this past week has been a story of how powerful people were threatened by what Jesus did and by what Jesus taught and by how people responded to him, particularly those who found in him hope for a new life. These religious leaders assumed that God's kingdom would bring them more power, would bring them more prestige, but Jesus had people believing that the kingdom of God was for the poor and for the outsider, and, and that real power comes in serving others in love. And that conflict intensified. Jesus disrupted the temple worship. He turned over those tables in the temple courtyard, and he calls out Israel's leaders as a den of robbers, as a den of rebels, and they accuse him. They arrest him, and they accused him before the Roman authorities and said, yeah, he is a rebel king. Yeah, he is trying to overthrow Rome. Yes, he was handed over for execution, even though he was innocent, even though the Roman governor knew he was innocent taken outside the city, put to death on these false charges. And it was a religious leader named Joseph who opposed Jesus' execution. And he requested that the body be given to him so that he could bury Jesus in a nearby tomb. In every account of any story of any leader throughout history, that is usually the end of the story. End of a story, a prophet who dares to help people hope and dream for a whole new reality who gets put to death, who gets pushed aside, whose message is ended with them. But here we are a couple days later, and the unexpected has happened. So women who followed Jesus came to visit the tomb, and they found it open, and they found it empty. And they were terrified. What in the world could this be about? And then they encounter these mysterious figures asking them why they're looking for the living among the dead, because Jesus not, is not here. He is risen. And the women finally understand but when they go back to tell the apostles, nobody believes them. Nobody believes their report. I mean, Jesus can't be alive because we saw him die. And we know the guy who put him in a tomb. But that very same day, even in the midst of their unbelief, even with Peter seeing for himself but still not understanding what in the world is happening, there are these two followers of Jesus who were leaving the city and traveling on a road to a town called Emmaus. And we're told they were sad and they're confused about everything that could have happened. And Jesus shows up and begins walking beside them, but they're not able to recognize him for, for whatever reason. They just can't understand that this is Jesus who is with them. They're blind to him for some reason. And Jesus asks them, so what are you guys talking about? And so they begin to tell him about Jesus, this powerful prophet who they expected to rescue Israel, but it was instead executed. And these women say he's alive, but that's just crazy. And it's all too much. And so we're going home. So Jesus, as he's walking along, as this stranger explains to them, this is what the Jewish scriptures have been pointing to all along. This is that grand sweep of the story that sometimes we miss of what God is doing in the world through Christ. 
that Israel needed a king who would suffer and die as a criminal on behalf of those who actually are sinners, and that he would be vindicated by his resurrection so that he can give true life to those who will receive it. But we get the sense that it's still just not making any sense to them. They're confused as ever. And then we get to the scene where they sit down for a meal with Jesus, and he takes bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it to them, just as he did at the Last Supper, just a few days before. This image of his broken body, his death on the cross, it's when they take in the broken bread that their eyes are opened, and now they can see Jesus. He disappears, and they run back to Jerusalem to share their story. In Luke's gospel, the stories from that first Easter show how hard it really is for us to wrap our minds around Jesus' resurrection, no less than a kingdom that's based on humility and on self-sacrifice, and yet here we are today daring to believe, daring to believe. And perhaps we believe because we have some sort of rational logic or linear thought process that, that leads us to this being a truth, but that kind of strange credibility because the disciples did not believe the women's message and the two disciples heading to Emmaus couldn't make sense of the explanation from the stranger who was Jesus, even if they said later our hearts were burning within us as he interpreted the scriptures to us. And perhaps we believe because of it's the faith that was passed down to us by our parents and by our grandparents and by all of the great saints who have shared this faith with each new generation. And there's a whole lot of great truth in a received faith. But can we really say that we believe in the resurrection when it's all that we have ever known? No, I think we know the truth of resurrection when our own eyes are opened, just like those disciples at Emmaus, when our own eyes are opened, when we see the resurrected Christ and we experience new life for ourselves. That's really what I think. I don't think belief in the resurrection precedes our experience of new life, by experience it, then we understand. That's why it's called faith. Our eyes are open to resurrection when we see a life that is radically changed and transformed by the power of Christ. We don't know how they got from where they were in their life to where they are now, except by something extraordinary that happened. Our eyes are open to resurrection when we see hope overcome despair in the worst of circumstances. Our eyes are open to resurrection when we see somebody willingly giving up power or prestige or privilege so that God's justice can become a reality. Our eyes are open to resurrection when we see compassion shared with someone who is hurting when they seem to be invisible to everybody else who is turning a blind eye. And our eyes are open to resurrection when we see bridges built And friendships formed across race and across class and across nationality and across creed and across every other human division, even when the powers tell us that we're supposed to be enemies. The only way we've built that bridge is because of the power of Christ. And our eyes are open to resurrection when we realize that Jesus is about life and all that brings life and all that preserves life and all that restores life. That's why Jesus told us in Matthew 25 that, that, that whenever you've fed the hungry or given, given water to someone who is thirsty or welcomed a stranger or clothed the naked or visited someone who is sick or is in prison, you have done it unto him. Because that's new life brought to that person's life. And Jesus is about new life. That's hope emerging from the midst of despair. That is resurrection. That's where we see it. That's where we experience it. That's when it becomes real for us, and our eyes are open to understand the difference Jesus truly makes. So how will resurrection become a part of your story? How will God bring new life to you, just like God did to the women and to the disciples and to those heading home to Emmaus? How will you experience new life emerging from the places or you feel like you're at a dead end, or you feel like you're caught in a very selfish way of living, or where you are struggling with a brokenness and wounds caused by other people. The answer begins and ends with Christ alone. It's a sacred, it's an imperishable gift of our salvation. 
It's the assurance that in Christ you are loved. In Christ, death will not be the final word. In Christ, your present struggles are nothing compared to the glory that is to come. That in Christ, you will find greater purpose. You will find deeper meaning in everything that you do. That we no longer live unto ourselves. There's something so far beyond us, so much bigger than us that we get to be a part of. It's the way that Christ is bringing new life into this world. That we can have a relationship with a God who created us and who has never given up on us and wants to redeem us and restore us and will never let us go. In Christ, we can have abundant life that is sacred and enduring and eternal. We simply have to receive it. The invitation is there. We simply have to answer it. The grace has already been given, and we're the only ones standing between us and a new life offered to all of us. The end of the story in the Gospels is the beginning of our story here today. Jesus tells the disciples at the end of Luke that he's going to give them the same divine power that sustained him so that they can go out and share the good news of God's kingdom with other people. God has opened a way for us to be redeemed, for us to be restored. God has given us the Holy Spirit to strengthen our faith and sustain our hope and empower us to love. That is the good news that we celebrate today. That is the good news that you are invited to accept and receive for yourself today. That is the good news that we need to leave these walls and share with everyone we meet that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.